Okay, hi, I'm Andrew. Um, I want to talk to you today about some experiences we've had at Slack with shipping a cross-platform uh, Web C product and some of the things we've learned. Um, so, although it's not the main subject of the talk, I wanted to, I thought it would be interesting to go through a brief architecture tour. Um, so, you can see um, we have two clients here connecting to a media server, and all of our calls actually go through a media server, even one-to-one -one calls. Um, just to step quickly through how uh, a client makes a call in the Slack architecture. First talks to a region server to uh, understand where it is and which media server it's going to connect to. Um, it then makes uh, some API calls to the Slack REST API um, uh, where the call state is stored um, in the same database that the rest of the um, Slack clients store state in. Um, that API call returns uh, uh, certain IDs and which media server to talk to and tokens and so on. And then the rest of the call set up it goes through the media server. Um, and so the call is established. The only other kind of Slack specific interesting thing to note is that um, some of the client state is updated via the real time messaging API. Um, but today I mainly want to talk about uh, client side development and our approach to it. Um, so uh, in terms of client platforms, on browser we support Chrome. On uh, desktop, uh, Mac, Windows, and Linux, and uh, mobile, uh, iOS, and Android. Um, and so you've seen a diagram similar to this before, but this is just like a super simple breakdown of a WebRTC client stack. You have a UI layer, uh, application logic and signaling layer, and then a native WebRTC layer on the bottom. Um, so as part of this, um, I'm also assuming you've rolled your own WebRTC binaries, and as we've heard several times, that's not going to be the right path for everyone. Um, but that's the path that we've taken, and um, that's what I'm going to assume as we go along here. Um, and the part I really want to talk to you about is the middle layer, the um, application logic and signaling layer, and its API with the, the UI layer above it. Um, so first, a bit of history uh, about Slack audio calls. We launched uh, in April of this year, and one of the platforms we launched on was um, a Slack Mac native app. Um, and um, this app is based on Mac app, which is basically a WebKit wrapper. Um, so it's like a single site browser container to run the, um, the Slack web app. Um, and the interesting bit here, as far as calling was concerned, is that it, although it, it is very browser-like, it didn't have any WebRTC in it. Um, so we already knew, uh, having to launch on this platform, that we'd be uh, building our own um, WebRTC C++ binaries. Um, so that was a given. Um, the, this is a diagram of uh, kind of the split between the browser and the desktop uh, native app, app um, implementations. So the top layer is a shared JavaScript UI code layer, um, which calls down into either JavaScript or C++, depending on whether it's browser or desktop, um, and further down into WebRTC, either the browser-based one or uh, the native one that we've uh, rolled ourselves. Um, so these two, when we were developing this product, uh, these two were developed in tandem. Um, and uh, that worked fine um, um, because uh, it was the same team developing everything. So this uh, pink band I've put on here, which will come back a few times, um, is to represent the uh, application logic. Um, and that's actually, uh, as you can see here, it was spread between the kind of wrapper layer and the UI code layer. Um, and again, that worked fine because uh, it was the same team doing this whole development. So uh, we didn't have a very like precise um, uh, interface between the application logic and the UI code, but that was okay, it worked fine. Um, the API between the, uh, the WebRTC wrapper and the UI code uh, was pretty low level. It consisted of a few weekly type methods, passing JSON messages directly from our media server. Um, so uh, again, not like, not really like clearly defined uh, layers. Things were kind of spread out. Um, and that worked fine, but uh, trouble appeared as we expanded to mobile um, because it was not our team any longer uh, developing the UI code. So we had this application logic that was spread out into the UI layer, and um, the mobile platform teams ended up having to re-implement a lot of that um, and do a lot of parsing of raw JSON messages from the media server that they might not care about. Um, and so we ended up launching on mobile in this state, but it definitely slowed progress. Um, and adding features later would continue to be costly. Um, so this is a different view um, based on kind of like an org of the uh, Slack teams. So uh, the calls team is vending the C++ library to the various platform client teams. And um, again, this is showing like 
this repeated application logic being uh, re-implemented on by the various teams. Um, so we launched in the state, but afterwards decided to uh, reimagine the approach. Um, so what we took a step back and said, what is the ideal cross-platform design this, in this context? Um, we want, ideally, to write once and run anywhere. Uh, this has a few benefits. You can consolidate your features and, more importantly, probably your, your bugs in one place. Um, and it insulates platform developers or client developers from details they shouldn't have to care about. Um, we're working in a very uh, complex domain, and the um, Java and Objective-C developers probably don't want to have to care about all the um, WebRTC stuff. So it's great if you can um, insulate them from that. Um, the second thing is to provide a natural API to the developers, um, something that they can interact with very easily. Um, so ideally, you would give them something that's exposed in the language they're working with, so platform-specific language bindings. Um, another, thing we, another goal we had was to make it strongly typed. Um, so rather than passing JSON messages around, um, actually have um, strong types that we can enforce um, to let us move a certain class of errors from runtime errors to compile time errors. Um, and so this is just the same diagram again, moving all the application logic to the wrapper layer that our team is, is implementing. And again, the view where we do all the stuff that we should be doing. Um, so what did we decide to do? Um, we continued to uh, write the application logic in C++. Um, a few reasons for this. Uh, the native WebRTC libs are in C++, so, and we're building those. And so whatever we do, we're going to have to be calling down into that language. Um, so keeping it in the same language makes some sense. But also, if you're writing a modern C++, um, it's actually a fairly painless experience. Um, dare I say, occasionally delightful. Uh, if, you, if, if all you remember of C++ is like your grandfather's or grandmother's C++, then uh, have another look at it. It's, it's come a long way. Um, so that was the implementation, and on top of that, we had, uh, or we do have, an API written in Dropbox's Genie. Um, this is a tool that Dropbox open sourced in 2014, and it's built for this exact uh, task. Um, it uses a simple interface definition language, um, which is language agnostic, uh, to generate bindings for Java and Objective-C. And uh, it, it handles, uh, so it generates Java and Objective-C and C++ on the backend side, and also handles all the data marshalling um, between the languages. Um, so it, uh, it, it's turned out to work really well. Um, some, just before I dive into Genie a bit more, some alternatives we considered. We looked at RPC frameworks. Um, one benefit, or the main benefit, is that they offer the same kind of cross-platform API generation and, um, and data marshalling. Um, but it turned out not really to be a great fit for the domain. Um, it's not designed, they're typically not designed for running in process, which makes sense given uh, the usual applications. Um, maybe gRPC, uh, it, it might offer this eventually. I think the Java implementation has an in-process server right now, um, but it's, it's not quite there yet. Um, and another problem is that they can be really heavyweight. Thrift, in particular, um, generates a lot of classes. Um, and on Android, that can become a problem. So there's and even a Microsoft project called Thrifty um, intended for Android to reduce the number of classes that um, get produced by Thrift. Um, OK, so jumping back into the Genie, I just wanted to give a quick example of, of what it looks like. So here's a super simple interface you can write with two methods, one of them static, to, um, to actually create the interface. Um, beside the interface keyword, you can see a plus C. That means um, this interface will be implemented in C++ and callable from Java and Objective-C. And so the, the second two boxes, you can see the Java um, generated code and the Objective-C generated code. Um, so these are just the interfaces. What you don't see here uh, is a bunch of intermediate code that handles all the data marshalling down to C++ and, and vice versa. Um, and so for anyone who's had to write JNI by hand before, you can imagine how nice this is to have a tool that just does it. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is a callback interface. So you can see there's a plus O and plus J beside the interface keyword. And this means uh, it'll be implemented in Objective-C and Java. And we can call it from C++. And this is the C++ generated code that you get that's callable from your backend library. Uh, so at current count, Genie's generated more than 5,000 lines of boilerplate code for us, which is awesome. Um, and even more important than just like the raw number is that as we make changes to the interface, we don't have to sift through all the code and, and you know, redo all the plumbing and everything. It's just like totally done for us. So um, 
So it's worked out really well. Um, there's a few, I wouldn't say caveats, but things we learned along the way. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, what level of abstraction should you choose uh, for the API? Um, and this might be, it probably is obvious in retrospect, but it wasn't to us um, at the beginning. But it did become very clear that we should base it around UI events and actions. Um, so there'll be layout differences, of course, in the different platforms. But the essential call UI elements are retained across all the platforms. And um, so it becomes very natural for the platform developers to interact with the library this way. You know, like a user makes an action, clicks a button or something, and we call method X on the library. Um, we have some callback method, and that results in the platform code making some UI update. Um, so when you start to think about it in this terms, the, a, a natural API emerges from what you're trying to do. Um, this is just an example of some more Genie code. Um, I only put it here to note that we, kind of in the documentation, we have actually UI suggestions along with the events. So um, the idea being that we like encourage, um, I mean, beyond the design specs, we actually, like when the implementation is happening, we encourage the developers to to make the same kinds of UI updates on the various platforms. Um, another lesson learned um, is around threading models. Always assume that the UI thread is hitting the library. Um, this might not always be the case, uh, at least, but in, in our case it is. Um, and so definitely make all methods, heavy methods asynchronous so you're never um, blocking the UI thread. Um, we ended up deciding to make all methods async um, just to make the threading model easier. Um, and that's what you see an example of here. So every, um, method call into the library uh, just post to a, a background thread. Um, another uh, threading model type tip is that the JVM gets upset when it's accessed by non-Java created threads. So you need to provide a mechanism for C++ to uh, create Java threads whenever those are going to be calling back into um, Java land. Uh, some good resources um, around this stuff. Uh, Genie has a project called MX3, um, which is great for showing uh, best practices. And they even have good implementations of um, some useful objects, uh, like a thread launcher that handles the creating uh, platform threads that I just discussed, um, and UI thread event loops for posting back to the, the platform UI threads. Um, another great resource is the mobile C++ Slack community team. Um, it's a great place to log on and ask some questions. I'm on there. Um, there's some Genie maintainers that are on there, so you can probably get your questions answered if you go there. Um, I wanted to uh, show a quick case study. Um, so this plot is of call survey results for Android clients. So at the end of a random sampling of calls, we give a, a survey and ask the user what they thought about the call with a few options. Um, I've eliminated uh, everything besides the top two answers. Um, so disconnects are, are bad, of course, and OK means like, yeah, the call was fine. Um, we released this library in 2.19, uh, the 2.19 version of the Android client, and you can see that disconnects went down considerably, and um, at the same time, the OK uh, rating uh, went up quite a bit. And so we weren't expecting this. We were like, hey, what happened? Um, and uh, I attribute it actually to, um, we ended up, part of the application logic that was uh, implemented uh, in the Android UI layer was stuff around reconnections. Um, and it's tricky stuff, deciding when to do this properly. We have some like very precise rules around it. Um, and so I think when we brought that back into our C++ library um, and had it implemented by people who like were intimately familiar with the details of it, um, we basically did it better. And this is not to say like, hey, those guys are horrible or whatever, but just that um, when you bring things into your problem domain, you have a better chance of doing it right than having to like communicate requirements to people who might not understand them beforehand. Um, so that was a very positive result of, of launching this. Um, so alternative architectures. Um, as you've heard today, there are a lot of different ways you can approach this, but um, there are two that are kind of most exciting in my mind. Um, one is the one I've described today, the C++ and Origini approach, and the other is hybrid apps um, using JavaScript and, and React Native or something like it. And I think the choice comes down to mainly what your existing code base is like. Um, so like, do you have Java and Objective-C mobile apps already? Um, then probably what I'm describing now is going to be a, a good choice. Um, but if you have like a WebRTC web app today and are considering expanding the mobile, then I think the JavaScript and React Native approach is really exciting. Uh, OK, but you might accuse me of being a liar. We'd still have to write it twice because we have this browser implementation and we have to write the JavaScript too. Um, and yeah, that's true. That is true. Uh, but we kind of have a plan. Uh, it's called Inscripten. 
Um, and it's a C++ to JavaScript transpiler. Um, we have some patches on top of Genie that will produce in, in scripting bindings for us from the Genie IDL. Um, and you know, it's, we have this kind of hand wavy plan, um, not actually developed, but if it works, it really will be kind of a write once, run anywhere thing. Um, so we haven't developed this yet, but if we end up doing it, I'm sure we'll write a blog post or something, so stay tuned. Thank you. <laughs>